In the real world, your model and database will grow and evolve as your application evolves. You've got to be able to make changes with as little friction as possible. Hi, I'm Ward Bell, VP of Technology at IdeaBlade, and I'm going to show you how to extend the model we built in Part 1. You can play along and get more detail by following the link on your screen. A brief reminder that we're using the DevForce Code First preview for this demonstration. You shouldn't build production code on this preview. The official supported release will come along soon. Until then, enjoy the preview and please give us your feedback. We'll pick up from the end of Part 1, where we wrote two entity classes by hand, category and product. We let Entity Framework Code First generate the database, and we use standard DevForce client-side programming techniques to save and query data. You're looking at a screenshot of the WPF console application we built, displaying product query results. If you missed Part 1, please look at it and just follow that link on your screen. Here in Part 2, we'll add a new supplier entity. Supplier won't conform to the Entity Framework conventions, so we'll use attributes to configure the mapping. These attributes don't exist in Silverlight. On the chance that we'll use the model in a Silverlight client, we'll add the Code First Silverlight shim that finesses the problem. We add the supplier DB set to the custom DB context. Rather than drop the test database every time we change the model, we'll tell Entity Framework to do that for us. We'll add a supplier's query to our Entity Manager, and then we'll update the UI and we'll see our revision in action. Here we go. Open the model file. We're going to add a supplier entity class here. We want to specify that the corresponding table name is or should be supplier, the singular, not suppliers plural. EF code first convention expects suppliers plural. So we'll tell it what we really want by marking the class with the table configuration attribute. ReSharper suggests that we could get it from one of two places. We really need to get it from the second one, data annotations. Make sure you pick that. This is a good time to observe that data modeling attributes, such as table and column, aren't in Silverlight. If you think this model might be used in a Silverlight app, you need definitions for these attributes that compile with Silverlight DLLs. We thought of that for you. Here's a conditional Silverlight shim for the top of the code file. So now we're ready to fill in the supplier class, starting with the primary key property using the CF prop snippet. You remember those from part one? Okay. It's a string, an unusual choice, and uh, it's called supplier code, not ID. This is not the conventional name for a primary key. In fact, Entity Framework Code first won't recognize it. It expects the name to end in ID. So we'll mark the property with the key configuration attribute, which is not resolvable right now. So we need to add a reference to system.componentmodel.dataannotations, which we'll search for with the word data annotations. There it is. We'll just double click it and we've got it. And now uh, we'll clean up our references, close that up and key is resolvable. By the way, if your add reference dialog lacks that nifty search feature I just used, consider adding the Productivity Power Tools extension from Microsoft. I'll show you here in my extension manager. I've got it right there. And if you go to its website, there's information all about it and about the other great power tools. Back in Supplier, we'll add a name property. And we're done with supplier, so we can close that up and we'll open up product because we're going to add a navigation to a parent supplier using the CFRAF code snippet. Recall from part one that a parent navigation typically requires both the navigation property, which is supplier here and it's called supplier, and it requires a foreign key property that matches the primary key of supplier, so it's got to be a string and the name should match, so it's supplier code, and we have to fix this here. We have to copy that supplier code into the getter and setter string values, and we're done with the model. We'll open up our custom DB context and add the supplier DB set using the CFDB set code snippet. 
It's called suppliers. And that's theoretically all we need to do, except we've been making some really significant changes to the model. Right now, our, our existing development database schema is incompatible with this new model. Looking at the SQL Manager, you know, there's no supplier table here, and if we opened up the product table, we wouldn't find a supplier code field there either. So if we were to try and build and run right now, it would blow up. Now we could do what the message suggests and delete the database manually, and then when we build and run again, Entity Framework would recreate the database to match our new model. But that's really annoying. Instead, we'll add a constructor with a Couture code snippet and drop in the set initializer code that tells Entity Framework to drop and recreate the database if it detects the mismatch. You definitely want to remove this code as soon as you have real data you want to keep, because if you don't, someday it'll whack the existing database without warning, and you'll be really sorry. But it's super convenient now, because when we rebuild, the build succeeds. Now you can't tell by looking, but the build also regenerated a DevForce metadata file, the IBMMX. And if we look in SQL Management Studio, and we refresh the database, and open the tables, we'll see our supplier, not suppliers table there, because of the table attribute, and there's the name, Invercare Max. And if we open products, and we open the columns there, there's our supplier code foreign key, Invercare 128. The name Envercare Max? Boy, the DBA isn't going to like this. But remember, we're doing code first. We don't care about optimal schemas at this stage. Later, when the DBA has had her say, we'll adjust our model mappings to meet her requirements. But for now, we continue in blissful and willful ignorance. We'll open the Product Entities Entity Manager, open up the Entity Queries, and we'll Add a supplier's entity query using the CFEQ code snippet. It's suppliers done and saved. We'll update the UI to show the supplier. Let's open the code behind, find add test data, open it up, and we're going to create a new supplier here if we have to. What we're doing is we're querying for the first supplier. If there isn't one, if it's null, we create one. Next, we associate the new products with the parent supplier, the one we either retrieved or created, by adding supplier to the product initializations. Close that. Scroll down, find query test data, uh, where we'll include suppliers in the query results. So we get both the parent category and the parent supplier with each product we download. Finally, we'll show the supplier in the logged product. We'll extend the format string, go down to the list, and add two more items. The product's supplier code, followed by the navigation from the product to the supplier in cache, and from there to the supplier's name. And we're done here. Close up, press F5, and let her rip. Here she comes, and there's our new supplier. Thanks for watching part two of our Code First walkthrough. More Code First goodness is coming. Please check in periodically at the DevForce Resource Center and at www.ideablade.com. Happy coding!